Hello there, it's Tom here, and this is chapter 44 of Gunner Creek Court, Crash Course. Now, this is one of my favourite chapters, because it has a lot to do with Annie and Asingran's relationship. And if that's something that you are interested in hearing me talk about, I actually did a little presentation at Google about this very thing. And I'll leave a link in the description if you want to see a video of me very awkwardly talking about that. But to get back to this chapter, this is after Annie was attacked by Asingran a few chapters ago. And she's not gone back to the forest to see him since then. And it's also set before Annie knows that Cat and Path are dating, which is another thing that's sort of going on in the background that will be explored later on. And on this page, I think is a good example of something that I might like to talk about in the future, which is that I try to keep a consistent style of fashion for each of the characters, the sort of clothing that they might choose to wear personally, but also try and tie them into what I think visually works for the comic and try and put forward a few visual cues. So in this example, this is one of the few times that I'll draw the interior of the court, or the court in general, looking very bright and welcoming and, and sunny. And to contrast that, Annie's clothes, which I consider to be a very classic sort of Annie forest outfit. Her clothes are quite muted and darker than Cat and Paths. And this sort of reflects where Annie will be later on in the chapter, in, in a much darker part of the forest than we've really seen before. So while she might stand out a little bit here in the court... By the time she heads into the forest, she blends right in, because because I do like to try and convey that she fits into the forest in a way that she doesn't quite fit into the court. And so we catch up with a few of the other characters, getting some updates on Smitty and passively with Parley as well, showing that she's in a trainer uniform and hanging out with Eglamour. Because at this point, he's beginning to teach her about her new roles and responsibilities. And at this point, Annie heads off into the forest with a sangrin. And just a word about some of the backgrounds here. Drawing the interior of the forest is something that I'm always changing and trying to improve upon because I think I've always struggled with drawing the interior of the forest. And I'm still looking for a nice, consistent way to represent areas that have lots of trees. This chapter shows a few different things that I was trying where I was sort of moving towards a more matte painting style for the backgrounds. One of the typical ways artists might use to paint a forest scene is to use direct reference or direct textures from photos of trees and foliage, that kind of thing, which is something that I have experimented with in the past outside of the comic, but I don't think that would really work here, because every time I've tried to use, say, for example, a texture lifted from a photo, it really stands out against the sort of simplistic style that I've developed for colouring the story. And I also have to keep in mind that I can't spend hours and hours on every panel drawing every individual tree and getting it looking perfect because of the nature of the timeline at which I release the pages. So for people keeping a close eye on that sort of thing, they might they might recognize that I very often play with the way that I illustrate the interior of the forest. But story-wise, Annie and Asingren have a little bit of a reconciliation and sort of pick up where they left off. And they head to this part of the forest that Asingren was taking her to, the darker side of the forest that I mentioned previously. And this scene was a chance for me to draw some forest creatures in a way that I normally hadn't in the story. These were a bunch of scary-looking weird monsters, and they all sort of hang out in this dingy, run-down area, and Asengren sort of lords over them with brute strength. And some of the panels in this section are some of my favourite pictures of Asengren, where, where he gets to let loose a little bit and have a bit of a scrap with these guys. I think I like the way he looks here, because it's in these scenes where he really puts his wooden body to good use. And we're seeing a kind of savage side to Asengren that we've always kind of imagined was there just under the surface, and we've caught a glimpse of before, but here he's let it come to the surface a little bit to lay down the law. And during this, Annie is called away by some other creature, some weird creature that claims to be part of the court or part of this seed bismuth that has cropped up very slightly in the story up to now. And actually gave me a chance to draw some bismuth crystals here, which was really interesting because because bismuth crystals are such an interesting shape and form that it was nice to sit with a bunch of reference pictures and, and sort of try to convey the weirdly iridescent structure that bismuth grows in. But we also see that Annie is being pushed into the ether without really knowing it. And we get the sense that there's something not quite right going on here. And of course, in the background, we see Coyote dropping a hint that this creature might not be telling the truth. And once Annie realizes this, she, she zaps back out of the ether and Coyote comes to the rescue. But since Coyote is not really part of this chapter, he's happy to exit just as quickly as he appeared, leaving Annie to get on with the rest of the chapter. And from here, we see using Coyote's advice, Annie gets a chance to use her powers to support Asengren and assert some strength in front of these creatures that are really not interested in hearing her or even Asengren talk. 
and Annie knows that it would be useless for her to jump into the battle throwing fists and punches and kicks around, trying to fight these creatures head on because because that would be completely unrealistic for someone of her size. So instead she uses the powers that she does have in a way that takes away the option for these creatures to really retaliate against her. And in this little sequence here, which I like a lot, it kind of starts out with Annie fitting into one panel, whereas this creature that is coming up to confront her is so massive that just his head and shoulders really fit into the panel. But because of the nature of Annie's powers, this creature actually ends up hurting himself rather than Annie attacking him or doing anything to harm him. And by the time he gets the picture and runs away, this last panel here shows that he's now the one who's the tiny little figure in the panel, and Annie's so giant now that all we see is her ankles, thanks to the perspective. And this little display of her strength is enough to get the other creatures to slink away into the background. And she mentions that this display of strength is not quite how she wanted to conduct her new role as a medium, but in this case it was a lesson that she learned that sometimes you have to use what works. And so after this, Sengren is extremely happy, probably the happiest we've ever seen him in the story. And he calls her beautiful, not in a sort of bashful or shameful way, but in a way where he's just very plainly and bluntly saying exactly what he means. And... And this is one of the reasons why I like writing a Sengren, because he seems like a, a sort of weird, brutish character who who might reflect some negative masculine stereotypes, but but also there's an aspect to his masculinity that allows him to say exactly what he thinks, and when he feels that something is beautiful to him, that he will just say it without any hesitation or any embarrassment. And I think that's a small aspect of, I guess you could say, masculine strength that I feel that you don't see very often. And in this case, for a singer to be so moved to say something like that to Annie, it's a huge compliment to her. And in this little winding down sequence, we really see how close the two of them are as he steps out of his tree body and allows her to tend to his wounds. And what's important to a singer here is thinking ways that he can help Annie become stronger in the future. And on the last panel here, I think this panel is an example of the limitation of the art and colouring style of the story. I still like this panel, but I do wish I could have made it a bit more impactful, I guess. Or, I'm not sure, there's, there's something I can't quite put my finger on, but I feel that a more experienced artist might have been able to convey the scene better than I did here. And I suppose I'm still constantly looking for a way to improve the art to the stage where I can look back at it in the future and, and feel that I've managed to convey what it was that I was thinking. But anyway, that's the end of that chapter, and this bonus page is another one of my favourites too. It, it kind of shows Annie's kooky sense of humour. I'm sure she knows full well how awful she looks coming in covered in bloodstains after having visited someone who had attacked her the previous time. And so there you go, that's the end of this chapter. Come back again for chapter 45, Thread. <laughs>